it. Let's do it. All right. We can have everybody grab their seats. It's filled up nicely here this morning. Looking like a good crowd. Uh, they're starting to quiet down. Good deal. Okay, grab your seats. We'll start with an opening prayer, please. If I can have your attention, hold your hands. Thank you. Uh, dear Lord, today we're going to work on the Ten Commandments again, 9 and 10. Uh, we're going to talk about stuff. Lord, it just seems like that's what we're driven by, getting stuff. Uh, forgive us, Lord, for that. Uh, in the lesson today, help us learn not to be so desirous of stuff, but rather desire you. Because, Lord, in you we find fulfillment. The trappings of this world don't fulfill what you do. You're, you're our joy and delight. Help us to look to you as our Savior and in that find true joy and happiness. And share that also with others in both what we say and what we do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Okay, uh, looking around, John has a couple of visitors here, or guests to uh, introduce to us. Please, John. Sure, this is my aunt and uncle, the single Fort Smith, Arkansas, Pete and Sharon Charles. Good to have you all here this morning. Thank you for being here. I don't think I see any other faces. Don't forget the possibilities here of giving to uh, India Seminary and also Pennies for Life. Any other announcements? Nice crowd this morning. Pastor, please. Perfect. Thank you, Don. All right. Good morning. Good to see everybody. Welcome back. Uh, another week here. And uh, we finish up here uh, our series on chiseled. And uh, just to, to be aware of that, this is our last one. We combine 9 and 10, uh, the commandments 9 and 10. If you're joining us online, uh, thank you, first of all, for doing that. Uh, also, the, uh, the Bible class sheet is always available on our website, and all that information is available for you uh, there as well. A uh, couple of announcements just to let you know. Uh, next week, we will have Pastor Greg here. Nicholas Greg uh, will lead a quick devotional and then have a little Q&A uh, for us. Uh, I'm not going to stream that for those of you joining us uh, online because we have such a vast number of people that aren't necessarily of faith, um, of faith. Well, maybe they're of faith, uh, but not of faith Lutheran, right? Um, I do want to let you know then because of uh, where we're going next in two weeks, we're going to take a, a little trip down a biblical context of heaven and hell. And uh, I have found that over the years, uh, there is a lot of misunderstanding of what about those two, and I'll say places, but they're not places. They're not a location. Uh, we often think about geography when it comes to heaven and hell. Really what we need to experience with that is who's it with? That's really what it boils down to. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So uh, in two weeks, we'll take a run at that and we'll stream it as always and, uh, and everything there. So this morning, as I said, the ninth and 10th commandment, it's really, if I can simplify it, I'm going to do some teaching today about coveting. It's not a word we use too often, at least not in everyday uh, conversation. What you'll hear from me periodically, if you ever share with me that, Pastor, we're praying for you, for one reason or another, praying for something that's personal for me, I will often say I covet those prayers. That's okay to do, right? Sometimes we say covet is bad. No, uh, and I'll, I'll express that today. It's what we covet, which is the problem. Um, you know, when God says I am a jealous God, jealous isn't bad. In that context, that's really, really important. And, and so to see that. So let me just take you a walk quick through the catechism here of the two commandments. They're there on your uh, worksheets as well. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. That means we should fear and love God so that we do not scheme. That's a key word. To get our neighbor's inheritance or house or to get in any way which only appears right, but help and be of service to him in keeping it. And we'll talk a little bit about what that means as well. Uh, then God goes and goes a little further than just your neighbor's house. You shall not cover your neighbor's wife. Now that starts to touch into uh, the sixth commandment. Or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. That means we should fear and love God so we do not entice or force away our neighbor's wife, workers, or animals. Or turn them against him, but urge them to stay and do their duty. That actually is pretty loaded when you think about what that's really calling us to do or not do. We often have a real problem with this, right? By what we say and, and so forth, we do try to turn people's opinion against things. If, if you don't think that that's true, uh, ask someone nearby sometime what their opinion is of the presidency. 
of any presidency, for that matter. And you'll find that they don't only disagree, or if they agree with you, they have strong reasons why you should agree with their viewpoint. Regardless, right? I mean, it's not me taking you know, pot shots at any administration, just simply to say, people say, I can't just have a different opinion. I have to speak poorly about someone else. We see that in our children a lot, um, that we've grown into a culture that in order for me to feel better about myself, I can knock other people down. And, and that's that same idea. And so you're, you're really working against that. And we'll talk about what that could mean as far as coveting. So coveting is a consuming desire. A consuming desire. It's different than greed or lust, right? A consuming desire is not the same as I want more stuff, okay? Uh, as, as Don was, was praying about that, that's where we focus on is our stuff uh, and wanting other people's stuff uh, and so forth. But greed is just, not just, it, God speaks to it in, in over a hundred different ways in the Bible. Greed is wanting more, right, of Money, resources, possessions, and so forth. Coveting is dealing with the mental, right? It's the emotion of going and going, I desire it. I'm consumed by it. I look for it, right? Um, I, I think this is starting to burn out in our culture a little bit. I don't know that people are necessarily waiting for the next cell phone to come out. It used to be, right? It used to be the new and improved had such dramatic changes that you're like, oh, I've got to have the new... I'll, I'll use iPhone, right? I don't know what we're up to now. iPhone like 11 or 12, 12, all right? Um, so when, when that was coming out, I remember what I often do is I often get like two models older. And they're really inexpensive, <laughs> right? And I, I have low expectations then um, and, and see those things. But anyhow, so what we're really after is really that desire, all right, is, is the internal drive uh, that gets into that. Greed is chasing after a target. Coveting is the mental, emotional, and I'll say spiritual, because we can't divorce ourselves from those things of wanting more, all right? Coveting is an evil attitude that is likely to e lead to an evil act. One of the things that we've got to gain some understanding in when it comes to our Christian walk is what you think. Your thought life is critical, right? A lot of times we think our thought life is private. And, and to some degree, I understand what people may imply by that. Like, for instance, uh, this, is, uh, this is just kind of a bizarre thing for me, and I, I struggle with this as a pastor. I, I, am, uh, I am hypersensitive to all the things going on in a worship service, right? If, if you are walking through the liturgy, right, in our, our order of service, as you go through, I have lots of other things on my mind when it, we're going through those things. I try not to, right? I was looking around this morning for how many little children we had, whether we could have a children's program. I was just kind of doing this during the hymn. I should have been singing, Right? And, and when there's communion, I'm trying to think of who's staying back in the pews that I'll go give communion to afterwards. I'm thinking about that. I should think about just distributing the very body and blood of Jesus. Right? See, the mindset, our thought life, leads sometimes to actions. In fact, many times. In fact, there's not really, other than a reflex, every action that you do starts with a thought. If you're writing a word down on your worksheet, that began as a thought. As I'm speaking, every one of these words began as a thought. They have to. Otherwise, it would just be gibberish. Okay? When you go to walk, even though you've done a lot of it over your lifetime, you still have to think about it. If you trip, you realize what you haven't done very well. <laughs> right? Right. <laughs> right? Um, so the point is, is that if we kind of downplay my thought life and what I think about, what I fantasize about, uh, and so forth, we realize that those things lead to actions that are often counter to what God calls us to do. And if we don't take care of the thought life, right, then those actions are actually a much shorter distance. If you can nip it in the bud, so to speak, right, and say, I don't want to think about that. I want to distract myself uh, and so forth. Then, um, then those actions will improve. If we just think I can think what I want and then I just have to govern my actions, God's actually much more concerned with the thought life. And we'll get into that a little bit more. Coveting wants what one cannot have, okay? It's not something that you have access to. If it was, you'd gain it, okay? If you want to move into a house that's more suitable to your family size, 
right? And you can have it, then you have it. Okay, you take certain steps, save your money, you know, whatever it takes to do that. If you just look at the Joneses, right? There's nobody named Jones here, so I'm being <laughs> critical, right? If you look to the Joneses and go, I want what they have, okay? And, and that desire becomes a little bit obsessive and so forth. How I treat the Joneses, how I think about the Joneses, what I spend my time thinking about. What does God want you to think about? Yeah. Him, period. Okay, in everything, right? Pray, you know, continually be focused on it. And everything you do, praise God, okay? And, and so when we say, oh, I want to praise God, but I really want the Joneses' house. I want a house like that. I want what they have. I, and suddenly you see that that gets consuming to where I miss that opportunity to reconnect with God in ways that he is laying out in front of me constantly, right? Those opportunities, Coveting essentially wants more. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tweak that a little bit when we talk about greed. Would you guys look up uh, Ecclesiastes 4.8, please? Uh, Old Testament, Ecclesiastes. Somebody have that. One person who has no other, either son or brother, yet there is no end to all his toil, and his eyes are never satisfied with riches, so that he never has all right. So kind of flushing this out a little bit as uh, a great man of God penned those words, uh, obviously inspired by God as well. Talking about our, 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 our purpose in life can be very derailed by the pursuit of things. Right, that we just—it's vanity. It's—it's it's thinking I want these things and we chase after them. God really offers us through the Lord's prayer. Um, what did He say we should want in the Lord's prayer? Daily bread. Daily bread. Anybody got more than that? We all do. Okay. My point is, is that God has been wonderfully gracious to us as people. And, and most people across the globe, I, I know that there's great poverty and suffering in places, but God offers us and grants us in, in most contexts the daily things that we need. Now, that may mean that we need to pursue those things every day, right? I'm fascinated by these survival shows that come on TV. I just am. I, I am fascinated that the human body is able to endure much more than I do on a daily basis, right? I don't get up in the morning and then kind of go, I'm going to have to start a fire, I'm going to have to find food. I got to, you know, fix my shelter or whatever. But when I watch these survival shows like Bear Grylls, he's always fascinated me, right? Uh, and, and see these things. This is what the body can do. But if you pursue daily things, right, that kind of keeps you, your day kind of simple. You and I, our days have gotten complicated, right, as, as we pursue lots of things. And, and lots of, a lot of those things are, are wants, and, and again, I, I want to get to the point of what God is addressing in these two final commandments to chisel us is to monitor your thought life. What is it that you are obsessing over? And, and there are times where you may walk around your house and just, I want a different house than this. I wish that it had this. I wish that it didn't have this and, and so forth. When we obsess over those things, God says that thought life is going to start to cause you problems and it's going to become a, a, a separation, a barrier between you and I, because you're going to be focusing on this. You can imagine what happens in a marriage when one mar member of the marriage is focusing on something other than their spouse, right? Whether that's an adulterous affair, whether it's the greed of things, or just the pursuit and mindset of other things, it detracts. And, and so with God, it's no different. Coveting, uh, I would argue, is sinister in this. It's hidden. One could not necessarily be tried and found guilty of coveting, right? I, I don't think many of you could sit with somebody else and kind of go, you are coveting a lot. Unless, of course, they're talking about it a lot, which you can, right? Those thoughts, right? They start as thoughts and then eventually they come out and communicate. But coveting, this is why God wants this to be a, something that we self-chisel, as it were, right? Taking the chisel and kind of chipping here and there to be able to go, I got a problem obsessing over these things. In fact, today, I want to challenge you. Just be mindful of these commandments today and just follow your thought life as best you can, right? It's not something we're in the habit of doing, but have that sobering reality of going, what do I spend my time thinking about, right? Now, it might be really good things, but I, I want you to understand, we can covet good things 
and they can still be obsessive and detracting. Right? You can, you can, you know, I, I've shared this with you. Um, it, you know, sometimes we talk about a healthy church uh, is a church that's full all the time, all throughout the week. I don't know that that's necessarily on, at, in black and white true. And here's what I mean by that. If you as members of Faith Lutheran Church spend a lot of your time here at church, what does your pastor really wish you were doing? Out there, right? What's this? This is halftime. Right? Which means we don't stay here. Imagine a football team goes into halftime, meets with the coach, goes over the plays, and goes, ready, break, and then they all sit back down on the benches. And then go, what, what should we do now? I, I don't know. Let's just talk about those plays some more. Right? Let's get some more water. Let's, uh, let's bandage up what we've already bandaged. Let's, um, let's talk about next week's game. Let's talk about our intention of playing in the championship one day. Right? Instead, break and go. Uh, now, we come up and meet up here, various groups, teams, meetings, boards, things like that. But if you have found yourself, we find this in churches, that 90% of the work in a church is done by 10% of the people. That's not good. right? Now, I, I know that there's a maturity level in every church. There's people that are just deeper, more mature, and so forth. It should always be that way, like in a family. right? That's when the parents kind of tell the kids, because I said so. right? I'm older, wiser, right? more experienced. And so forth. In a church, that's true too. But if we have 90% of the work done by 10% of the people, imagine what we could do if all the work was done by 80% of the people. Dividing it up, right? Sharing the load. And then not being here all the time. Not feeling like I've got to be here and, and so forth to be able to share that burden uh, and that responsibility. So why is coveting detrimental? There's a good word for you. Be the first one at brunch today to use that properly. Detrimental. Right? Deuteronomy 15. Would you look it up, please? Deuteronomy 15, 7 through 10. Let's see what coveting does to us. Deuteronomy 15, 7 through 10. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Fifth book of the what we call the Torah or the Pentateuch. If among you one of your brothers should become poor in any of your towns within your land that the Lord your God has given you, you shall not harden your heart or shut your hand against your poor brother. But you shall open your hand to him and lend him sufficient for his need, whatever it may be. Take care lest there be an unworthy thought in your heart, and you say, The seventh year, the year of release, is near. And your eye look grudgingly on your poor brother, and you give him nothing, and he cry to the Lord against you, and you be guilty of sin. You shall give to him freely, and your heart shall not be grudging when you give to him. Because for this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and all that you undertake. Thank you, Joyce. So if you think about that, if you listen to that, that was all about what's going on in your head, in your heart. It wasn't about what you're doing. Did you give enough money to your brother uh, or sister? Did you help out in the way it says? Did you begrudgingly think about it? Did you withhold it? That's all mental. And, and so what we recognize is coveting can hinder our generosity. Right? One of the great things in Acts 2 in the early church when God really, um, when Jesus ascended back to heaven and God really began the church through the work of the apostles, the proclaiming of the gospel, it says the early church was growing like crazy. And as they grew, here's what they did. They took care of each other. Not in a weird kind of commune way, but in a way it says if you need something and I have something, I give it to you. That's it. Doesn't get more complicated than that. I often think of it this way. When you come together for church, you should come with a bowl of rice. I'm just going to pick rice as a, as a substance. Okay. Now, that bowl of rice demonstrates what your week has been like, how God has provided for you, how the world has taken it from you, and so forth. Some people come to church on Sunday mornings, and their bowl is almost empty. It has been a tough week. They're just dealing with stuff. Some people come to church, their bowl is full. God has been good. Life has been strong. There's been a blessing and so forth. So guess what we do when we all come together for church? How are you doing? Right? What do we all say? Fine. Fine. Liars. <laughs> right? Lying in church. Okay? Now, I, I know that you don't, when you're shaking my hand or walking in the front doors, I'm like, good morning. How are you? You don't go, oh, man. And then suddenly there's a 20-minute conversation. You know, this happened, and then this happened. I know that. We kind of have certain polite conversation and so forth. But what better place should we be able to be where somebody kind of says, I have had a tough week. And you just note that and kind of go, can we talk afterwards? Can I call you later on? 
Let me pray with you right now here in the hallway and just ask for God's blessing and, and maybe sit with you in church, even though I have an assigned seat. I can sit by you. Sit by, I know this sounds radical, sit by you on the opposite side of the church where my other side is showing, right? And talk with them and sit with them and just encourage them. We could do that, right? Because that's when we recognize that's generosity to be able to say, I can give to you in some ways that you need. Let's keep going. Uh, ladies, Joshua 7 and uh, gentlemen, Micah 2. Ladies, Joshua 7, 21, gentlemen, Micah 2, 1 and 2. Let's see how else coveting can affect the body of Christ. Ladies, somebody, Joshua 7, 21. When I saw among the spoil a beautiful cloak from Shinar and 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, then I coveted them and, <coughs> and see they are hidden in the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath. So to give you some background of that particular story, when God sent his people uh, in to conquer the Holy Land and to take it back from uh, the pagans and so forth, uh, God had a rule. You don't take the spoils. That's not what motivates. You take it because God has given it to you. You don't go in there and go, hey, look, there's a bar of silver and some lovely uh, linens and some prizes and things like that. So why does he hide them? Well, he hides them because he's not supposed to have them, right? Right. And then so naturally God knows and he visits some angry God stuff upon the people. And they're like, why is he doing this? And he's like, somebody broke the rule. Somebody took something they weren't supposed to have. You ever have that in your, uh, my family, we used to do that growing up uh, when the Gledhill boys would all be called into the living room with dad. That usually means somebody messed up and he didn't know who it was. Well, he didn't openly say it was Eric. He just said, I'm going to give everybody a chance. <laughs> okay. And he'd say, who wants to tell the truth? And we'd all stand there and forward and just kind of go, stick to your story, stick to your story, right? And yet everybody's going to be punished until somebody comes clean. And so in Joshua, right, everybody's being punished by God until somebody says, what happened? And then finally somebody kind of goes, well, it was me. I found some stuff, really liked it. I like shiny things. And so I hid it in the ground underneath my tent. And, uh, and that was like coveting took hold of his heart. And he says, I must have it. And so I will disobey God's direct rule in order to have it. All right? Gentlemen, Micah 2, 1 and 2. Woe to those who devise wickedness and work evil on their beds. When the morning dawns, they perform it because it is in the power of their hands. They covet fields and seize them, and houses and take them away. They oppress a man and his house, a man and his inheritance. So it gives you some really clear understanding of what coveting is. I like that. Devise, right? That's mental, thinking in your head, your thought world. And then also laying on your bed. <laughs> I don't know how many weird thoughts I've had laying on my bed, imagining, you know, I'm going to do this and then that and, and so forth. Being on the bed, it just seems to be one of those places where your brain starts to kind of slow down sometimes. And, and you can have those thoughts. You start to have these dialogues with people you haven't had yet. Um, to certain actions that you're imagining you're going to have, whether it's at night or in the morning. Um, that's a place where we tend to devise things. Um, the bathroom and shower tends to be another place, but they don't bring, bring that up in the Bible. Uh, but that is another place where your brain uh, starts to work. I don't know how many times I wish that I had like wax crayons in the shower, right? Because I have this idea and I'm like, I have got to write that down, <laughs> you know? And then because by the time I'm done, I'm kind of like, you know, I'm like, I forgot what was so important that I wanted to remember. Um, so we see this. It is often a uh, motive for offenses against our neighbors, coveting is. It is often what motivates. Again, remember, an evil thought often uh, manifests itself in an evil act, right? I want this. I think I ought to do this. And so that starts out as a thought and then manifests itself in an action. Like, for instance, if you're going to steal something, that begins with a thought. If you're going to say something unkind to someone, it always begins with a thought. And, and so what God is really challenging us here to be chiseled, right, is to really evaluate your thought life. I, I know that that seems kind of foreign to us because we don't, we don't concern ourselves because it's hidden. We, we actually, I think we relish our thought life, Okay. Um, it, so I'll, I'll, I'll share some more sin from my life, right? Uh, there are times when somebody will be talking to me about something. None of you, of course, 
right? <laughs> They'll be talking to me, and in my brain, I am saying, pay attention, right? Pay attention to this. They're sharing with me details, and I'm like, this has nothing to do with what we started talking about. And it's just, you know, you're wandering. A lot of times it's kids, right? Sometimes I talk with little kids or, or things like that. We just go down a rabbit trail, and you're like, I'm sure that this is fascinating to them. And, and you, But see, that thought life, see, if you don't refocus that, then guess what then suddenly starts to translate? I watch people. This will make you guys uncomfortable when you come to talk to me. Um, I watch people's body language a great deal. right? I learn a lot. I tell you, as a pastor looking out on the congregation on Sunday morning, you can see a lot. right? <laughs> you can see a lot. Just, just watching people's body language. Okay? And, and so what that is, and it, you don't mean to do it, it's most of it's subconscious, uh, but most of that begins with a thought. I don't think this is all that interesting. I don't think this is for me. I don't like this hymn, right? And, uh, and then suddenly our body language communicates that. See, for us too, that's the idea, is it starts that offense to our neighbors. And granted, what are you supposed to be giving glory to, to your neighbor? God in what we say and do. And so when we obsess about things that aren't going to give glory to God, it affects our witness. Now you kind of go, well, pastor, it's just a thought. Mm -hmm. It's an opportunity. And you and I are going to fail over and over again. Let's fail less, right? Let's be mindful of when I'm in the presence of my neighbors, whether they are a believer or an unbeliever. Let's be mindful of what am I obsessing over in my head? What's my thought life like? Um, next one, New Testament here. Go to 1 Corinthians 6.10, please. 1 Corinthians 6.10. Nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. This is, uh, this is really something that is self-destructive. If we are coveters, if, if we fall into that trap, of obsessing over desiring things that are not yours, uh, that, that you know consume your thought life instead of focusing on the glory and goodness of God. Um, that's what's dangerous, right? If you obsess over the things of this world, this world goes away. At some point in time, everything in this world goes away. You, you don't get to take anything with you. And so if we obsess over it now and compromise our relationship with God, then that obsessing over those things is a problem. And it ultimately can become self-destructive. And I mean that eternally speaking. That's how heavy this is. Not just that, okay, I, I got to watch my thought life so it doesn't you know, manifest itself into evil acts. Okay, As soon as we kind of take a blasé approach to something in our life that is wrong, guess what? It gets a foothold. It's, it's like when you tell a fib and get away with it. It's a whole lot easier to fib again. And then it's a whole lot easier, a little white lie. And a whole lot easier to lie because you're like, ah, I'm pretty good at it. Okay? Uh, and, and to cover up those things and to hide that thought life and so forth. And yet it's growing uh, like a cancer inside of us. And we're just kind of letting it go unchecked. Hey, as long as it doesn't show, doesn't matter what's going on in here. Nobody sees it. And you're like, actually, somebody does. And it's actually the most important one season. Okay, last one here. Um, let's just look up this one. You're in uh, the New Testament there. You're near Ephesians 3, 5, and 6. Chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Ephesians, please. Which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So what that's about, all right, this is actually, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you why I think that's the, the right answer for this one. It's about idolatry. Um, the Jews were believing that they were the chosen people of God. And, and, uh, and therefore, everybody else was just lost. I don't know, because I didn't grow up in Jesus' time or the Old Testament time, of why Hebrews, then later Jews, um, how did they treat what they would have considered Gentiles or pagans, not God's chosen people? Did they just imagine that they were there taking up space? Right? I mean, you kind of sit there and go, well, I'm a Hebrew, or later on call ourselves Jews. We are the chosen people of God. We're the only ones that are going to receive the inheritance that God invites us to accept. But you're a Gentile, a Greek, a Roman, a, you know, whatever your pagan background is. Gentile, by the way, meant everybody who's not a Hebrew. Um, and they just must have thought, well, I live next door to them, and I ought to be kind to them. But really, what's the point? 
They're not God's people. They're not going to receive the inheritance. They're lost just by their genetics and their ethnicity. So why even bother? Right? Now, before we start thinking too piously about us as Christians that we are so enlightened and so forth, think about how we treat those of different religions and different races in different countries. Right? Sometimes we have the assumption that, well, everybody in the United States is Christian, basically. No, I hope you don't believe that. Uh, or that everyone around the world certainly is loved by God, but I, I'm not really the one that's responsible for being that love, right? And, and we start to have these barriers and so forth because our idolatry is in our identity. I am one of God's chosen people. So we should get together for church, line up in a great big circle, and just pat each other on the back. Good job. Good job being a believer. Okay, a little harder. Thank you. Yeah, I've done a good job this week. Okay, and instead to be able to say, thank God, he has granted me the gift of faith and understanding. Now, what do you do with it? Go find somebody who doesn't know. Go find somebody who needs a cold cup of water, right? And be able to share that goodness and that service with them. All right, so aside from company, that's how it's detrimental. It hinders our generosity. It often motivates an offense. It's self-destructive to ourself and it's idolatry. When you covet, in a sense, um, that identity that God has given you, and it costs you uh, this sense of a barrier to not want to reach out to someone else. I covet my identity. I'm good. I had somebody come up and introduce themselves. I had met them for all of about seven seconds, right? And, uh, and they knew that I was from Faith Lutheran Church. I was wearing one of my shirts and happened to stop off uh, at a local business and met a guy outside where we were kind of waiting around uh, for something. And, and uh, he just kind of came up and was like, oh, you're a Christian. And, uh, and I said, well, as a matter of fact, yeah, I am. Yeah, I'm a conservative. <laughs> That's what you open with. I said, well, I'm a Scorpio. <laughs> Not sure what to say about that. I didn't share what my horoscope because I couldn't care less. Um, the point was, is I just thought, I said, well, that's the most important thing right now is you greet somebody. I mean, why don't you just end and go, hey, here's who I voted for, you know, or, or here's how much money I think I should have or, or whatever. I just thought it was really odd that somehow his idol of who he is by that definition was really the first thing that I as a Christian ought to know, right? Here's what you need to know about me. I find that interesting when I'm in a group of people leading as a, as a pastor many times go, how about everybody introduce themselves and what they choose to do. I found it's much more helpful if I say, here's what I'd like you to share with the group instead of go, would you just introduce yourself? Because then some weird stuff like that comes out. Not that being conservative is weird. I, I just assume as Christians, you do conserve to the truth of God's word. Okay. But I hope you spread it very liberally. Okay. Right. All right. That was a good play on words there. <laughs> We are called to be content. You can look up that Hebrew passage in the future. So we are called to be content and not uh, not to be uh, covetous. That's, that's some of that, that uh, counterbalance that I want to see uh, for us. Because again, contentment is a mindset as well. If you are content, I hope that there is opportunity for you today to sit contently. Right? Now, it may not be uh, if you sit in the first service behind Sam and Mary Kate. You will not be content because of that baby. Because <laughs> you just sit there and you lose all focus because she is adorable and coos and makes all those beautiful... I assume it's her making that noise, Mary Kate. I don't know if that's, if that's you just kind of going, oh, I love this hymn and, and so forth. The point is, is we should sit contently with whatever God has blessed us with. Right? There should be that sense. And not sit there and go, oh, I just wish that I had this. I wish we could do this. I wish this was true or not true. Um, contentment is the, is the point. And it, again, it's mental. It's our thought life, right? Um, in your prayers, and, and our prayers are kind of a, a giveaway, a little bit of where our heart is. Um, our prayers are kind of a giveaway of what's going on inside. Um, I often used to share when I would pray with high school youth, when I was working with youth in, in past years, um, I would try to model prayer for them. And, and one of the things you find, children do this a lot, and you probably see it too, is their prayers are their laundry list. Please help, please help, please help, please help, please help. Da, 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 da. And, and I, granted, you should have plenty of things on your heart that say, God, I'd like to, you know, involve you in this so that you can help with this. But, but you understand that many times what you should be thankful for should way outnumber the things that you want. It should. Right. But, you know, we kind of think about those. I remember when I was at uh, Concordia in Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, where Kristen and I met, where we went to school. 
And uh, for one, I don't remember what the holiday was. It was a holiday weekend, like Memorial Day weekend or something like that. And we had a prayer vigil in the chapel there. It was a, it's a Lutheran college and, and it's a university now, but it, it had this prayer vigil. It was going to go for two and a half days, solid, solid prayer going on in the chapel. And you could sign up for an hour. And I thought, most of the time I pray, I, I don't time myself, but it wasn't anywhere near an hour. And I thought, there's no way I could pray for an hour. And people would write down on a clipboard when they'd come in things, you know, for the week before, things to pray for, things to ask for. And, and I was amazed of how quickly that hour went just by talking with God about things, thanking him for things, asking for things, seeking things, uh, and so forth. So we can do it. Um, and, and when you thank God for things, there's a real sense of contentment that comes over you, right? Even when you're dealing with difficulties, there's still good in those difficulties. God, thank you for bringing this difficulty into my life that has turned me to focus on you more intently. That's a good thing, right? And, and sometimes our loving Heavenly Father lets difficult things enter into our lives to strengthen that relationship, right? And, and we can have that contentment, okay? Um, so what kind of person is content? Paul gives it to us. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, please. 1 Thessalonians 5, 15 through 22. Uh, please go there for me. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, but test everything, hold fast to this good, abstain from every form of evil. So here's the interesting thing. That is a list of actions, right? It's a list of things that, sh that should be said of our church. What you're looking at right there, that would be a good resume for our church. If somebody says, hey, what's faith like? Now, I, I could tell you, most of you would answer faith, what faith is like in, in a couple of ways. Most of you would say it's really friendly, very welcoming, right? Biblically based. Um, you, you might say it's, it's filled with a great variety of people. Right, kinds of people from um, older folks to younger folks to middle-aged folks, all those kind of things. You might say all of those things. I would prefer, those are all good things, by the way, but they're kind of surface, right? Um, what I would prefer is what Paul just said. I'd love a church that is proclaimed that way, these things. Now, every one of those actions begins with what? What have I been talking about? Thought. It begins with thoughts. Right? You are not going to be a people driven to seek out God if that is not something you are in your thought life obsessing over. Right? That you are looking at things around us as church and in our impact in our community and say, but what does God call us to be? What do I need to think about so that I'm thinking about this? Um, if, if you can think uh, about honoring God in what you do, your actions are going to model that. You cannot think. How can I honor God and then just go out and do a sinful act just like that? You can't. For the same reason, you can't think sinful thoughts and then produce good fruit. God says throughout the Bible, he says, sin comes from sinful hearts, comes from inside of us. That's where it starts. So we've got to be able to address, be chiseled of those things right there. Um, according to Philippians 4, look that up. Contentment is learned. It is something we are learned. Or maybe I should use the word chiseled there. Contentment is something that needs to be worked out in our lives. How many times do we have to lecture children to share? Right? Or lecture children to be satisfied and content. Our kids today are actually marketed to in, in a higher degree than they've ever been before. I was, I'm amazed at this. I was, I was, watching, uh, I was watching a sporting event uh, this last weekend, and I was amazed in the span of time that I was watching how many um, pharmaceutical commercials came on. Now, I, I don't want to put any of our medical personnel on the spot, right? But the point is, is those decisions really ought to be left up to medical personnel. But if you put them on the, on the TV, at least my perspective on this, only mine, right, is, is I think for us to be able to go, I want that. Market it to me so that I can press and push and say, I want this. What I really want is somebody who knows a lot more medically than I do to say, I know that this is good for you and this is bad for you, and so I'm going to prescribe this. Instead of you go into your doctor and go, hey, that one with the kid on the skateboard and the rainbow and the, 
the bubbles, that's what I want. I think that's for me, right? And, and you know, just how silly that is that they're marketing to us so that I want it, right? And I desire that and, and so forth. To be content with being able to go, I want to be content with who knows what I don't know, who treats me in the way that is good for me, uh, and how God can care for me. Somebody have Philippians 4, 11 through 13, please. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Now, if you were in the earlier service, and I read Paul's spiritual resume of how he has suffered, and to hear him comment, right, of where his heart is there, to be able to say, I know what it means to be content. And it has nothing, let me repeat that, nothing to do with your circumstances. He says, I have had much and plenty, and I have had less, uh, and, and less than, you know, like nothing. And he said, and I've been content in that. And you're like, well, wait a minute, how's that possible? I'm only content when I have lots of food, and I don't have to work hard, and I'm safe and warm or cool or whatever the case may be. That's when I'm content. That's not contentment, Right? Contentment is recognizing that I am not obsessing over things that are not for me. I am obsessing over God and the gifts that he has given me and the life that he offers me. That's what I obsess over. So contentment is learned. So we not only need to learn it as Christians, we need to teach it. That's why we teach our children, right? To be able to say, no, 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 that's enough. No, no, I want another cookie. There's, there's a whole container up there. I mean, those, those are eventually mine. I'd like them all now. Okay, you're like, no, no, one is a snack, one's a treat, that's, that's enough. I want another one. In fact, I'll scream until I get one. Oh, what do you want to teach them? You want to teach them contentment or do you want to be able to say, no, 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 if you really want it bad enough, you should have it, right? That's kind of one of the problems in our culture right now is that we've said if you want something bad enough, maybe you should have it. Whether it's another spouse, whether it's a different job, a car, something that doesn't belong to you, Right? If you want it bad enough, that way your emotion trumps some ultimate authority, like God's commandments. Okay. Understanding co coveting, it does offer us some insight into the pathology of sin. So how can a mature Christian throw off the teachings of the word and blatantly sin? Right? Um, how can a mature Christian throw off those teachings uh, and blatantly sin? Here's how. Right? Here's how. It is seldom from a lack of knowledge right? But rather a decision to desire the wrong thing. So here's what I mean by that. For us to be chiseled, it is very rarely, and I'm speaking obviously to a group of people that are gathered together for Bible study. So ignorance of the word of God is not the problem. So let me ask you this morning, what's the problem? Ignorance of the word is not the problem. So what is the problem? The heart is, you're right, it's our internals. It's the application of it, right? That's the biggest problem for us. I know the truth. I just don't want to live by it, right? Remember what I mentioned this morning in the sermon, if you were there early today, um, earlier this morning, I talked about most people uh, somewhere along the, life, uh, along the line in their walk, or at least maybe many people, not most people of us, but um, I don't know what I'm trying to say other than... Um, Sometimes people will ask the question, what is the least that I have to do in order to be saved, be into heaven? That's really what the, the, the expert of the law was asking Jesus. Out of all the laws, what's the most important? I mean, out of 660 some, which ones do I really need to focus on? And God says, oh, great question, right, as Jesus was answering that. Love God with everything that you are. Remember, we talked about this, and love your neighbor as yourself. And if you want to know what that's a summary of, it's the Ten Commandments, which we are looking at. He says, so what's the most important? I already gave them to you. Right? A couple thousand years ago, still relevant. Okay? Follow those. See, for us, we may know the word of God, but we need to apply it. When God says, follow me, that means follow him. It doesn't just say that you're going to be asked, what should a Christian do? Follow Jesus. That's what the answer is. God is going to ask you at the gate to be able to say, did you? Not what the right answer is. He's not looking for trivia. He's going to say, all right, if God meets you at the pearly gates and says, why should I let you into my heaven? And you start listing off all the things that you have done or all the facts that you think you know, that's not going to work. 
You're going to say, well, I helped an old lady across the street, rescued a cat out of a tree, said my prayers often, right? Member of a church and so forth. I read my Bible. God would say, those are wonderful things. Good job. Now, back to the question. Why should I let you into my heaven? Let me just give you a little hint. If that does happen, look around his flowing robe and see Jesus and go, I know him. And that's when the father will turn around and say, son, you know this person? That's when you want Jesus to go, oh yeah, we're real close. I know him real well. Come on in. That's it. It's not about trivia. Not about answering questions. It's not about just knowing the word. You do need to have the building blocks. It's like the bricks. Got to have the bricks to build a wall. But if you think all it is about having a pile of bricks, that isn't it. Right? If you memorize scripture, that's excellent. If you don't apply that scripture to life, it's useless. I mean that. You just memorize. you like, that's got to count for something. It counts when it comes out as an action. It says, love your neighbor. you got to love your neighbor. motivates my life flows from my heart. And if I obsess and pursue the things that are not of God, then that is going to start to manifest itself in other ways. Let's wrap this up. Luke 5, uh, or I'm sorry, Luke 9, rather, 57 through 62. Somebody have it? As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, birds have the air, have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord. But let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. So what we see is that people say, I'd like to follow Jesus. And then Jesus says, here's what it means. Now, he is not being you know, uh, dismissive of the dead in that. But what he's saying is, if you put anything over and above me, that's wrong. Anything. And that's why that, that pulls on our heartstrings. You want to say, Lord, I do want to follow you, but I mean, honestly, this is more important than my following you. And Jesus says, no, it's not. Following me is key. Now, could you bury someone and still follow Jesus? Yes. yes. In fact, we do it all the time, right? We celebrate the gift that God has given us in eternal life, many times in a funeral, in a memorial service. I can tell you as a pastor, there is nothing more difficult than to not know the circumstance of the heart of the person that you're eulogizing. Because I will not speak something I do not know, right? Uh, that'd, that'd be really bad for the people that are there kind of going, I know what his heart was like. And if you're telling me he's in heaven for that, I don't have anything to worry about. I have nothing to work toward. Right? I have nothing to work out in my own life. All right, so Romans 7, 7 through 12. I'm going to let you look that up on your own, but here's how we can be chiseled, and I want to tie up this whole series with these. First of all, pray that God will renew your heart. That ought to be something that we do every single day. When your feet hit the ground, make that statement to God to be able to say, God, have, give me a clean heart today. Right? Recognize that it is a problem for us with sin. And it, it is a problem that nags at us and grows and festers inside of us all the day. But instead to be able to say, Lord, renew me today. Let me start new and fresh because of your grace so that this heart will then manifest itself in ways that will give glory to you today. Secondly, saturate your heart and mind with the word of God. I, I say this with all do concern for the people that receive this. If you receive the morning coffee Bible reading from me on your cell phone, and that is the only word of God that you touch all day long, it needs to change. If you get one verse from Scripture as a Christian to effectively equip you for the rest of the day, I'm not saying God can't use that, okay? But you might as well just eat a piece of plain toast in the morning and then not eat the rest of the day. And you see how you feel by the end of the day. You're going to go, man, I am really hungry. Okay, well, guess what? There's other places to feed, and we're blessed to be in a country where that's available. Thirdly, work at your worship of him. You should not be relaxed in worship. 
You should not sit back and go, this is so nice and easy. You know what you should be doing? No, focus. No, just don't think about that. Focus, right? What are these words that we're singing? These are beautiful words. I don't care what's for brunch. I'm going to focus here, right? I don't care that his stole is lopsided a little bit. I'm not going to focus on that, right? Well, listen, somebody told me that today. And they came up, the pastor, your stall was off kilter by about an inch. Thank you. <laughs> Let me talk about what's off kilter now. <laughs> now that I've shared it, I hope that person's not listening because they're not here. Right? <laughs> they still love one another. The point is, work at it, right? Worship would be something that when you're done, you're like, man, we've worked today. I have sung and I have focused and I've worked it out in my head. I've already started thinking about how do I want to do this. You ought to remember what the sermon is by the time you walk out of the sanctuary. You ought to, right? If you're focused and working it out, there should be like, I need to take this home with me. I need to remember this and work this out. I, I used to, when I was serving in St. Louis, there was two pastors, senior and associate. I was the associate at the time. And, and we would trade off and alternate preaching. And sometimes Pastor Christensen, who was a senior, he would preach the sermon. We'd go park ourselves after the service and shake hands would come out. People would often come by me. Great sermon. But last week, you got a good memory because I didn't preach this week. Of course, I wouldn't say that. I would praise God and, and so forth. I'm glad you enjoyed somebody in a robe preaching. Uh, but you didn't pay even attention to who it was. And he has hair, right? <laughs> last one. Uh, practice sacrificial giving. One of those actions that really helps our coveting uh, is that idea of just being content uh, with kind of saying, I can tithe, I can give. I don't worry about holding it back, right? One of the things that usually keeps us from tithing and giving is fear. I won't have enough. I won't be able to provide in the way that I need. What if, what if, what if, and all those things. When we have sacrificial giving going, God, I want to give this to you because you call me to. You command it, and I'm going to do it. And when I can do that with a good heart, not, not begrudgingly, right? Like, there you go. I hope you're happy, right? God would like, I am. I kind of like your heart, though, right? Um, nonetheless, that's what he sees. All right, let's close in prayer and uh, wrap it up. Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, I pray that through the last uh, nine weeks, nine weeks, uh, Lord, that, uh, that you have, through your Spirit, chiseled us. Uh, may we be mindful this day uh, of our thought life, May we be mindful of how these uh, commandments are meant to still today work in us and continue to work out in our lives. Chip away, Lord, those areas of our lives, those edges that are rough, uh, and those things that don't belong, that sin that has grabbed onto us. And uh, so, Lord, the, the, the image of your son is more obvious through us. That's our prayer. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. God bless you guys. Join us back here next week. Uh, Pastor Greg will be with us next week. The third announcement. Uh, let me shut this down. Again. The third announcement in uh, the static announcement.